Oh. Welcome to our final class, and I uh, promised that I'd speak today about final truths, and this was to try to uh, to to end on a note of on a note of uh, honesty and truth after all the errors we've been making all quarter, and uh, uh, I guess we we spoke uh, was it Nils that said that the one of the great one of the great um, techniques of technical exposition is to tell lies. Um, at, at first, and then to, and then once a person understands the the, uh, the simple thing, which isn't quite true, then you then you go into the uh, exceptions, which make it true. And, and uh, well, this quarter I've been getting I've been getting notes from people who have been looking over our handouts and uh, haven't had a chance to to speak themselves. And I'm not sure I'll represent their point of view perfectly, but I think it will at least co provide a, a counterbalance to what I've been saying. And um, I'm really glad to see that Paul is is back with us today too, so that he can uh, get his last word in uh, wherever we are. Um, now I uh, so so uh, one of the things Paul um, emphasized to great advantage on Wednesday was the importance of organization. And I feel here a little guilty that I haven't got a great organization today. I'm going to go through my 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 scheme is going to be to go through these notes that I've received and and put them into a bit of order only. Um, now, first of all, I, I got several comments from uh, Nancy Blackman's father, who's a professor at Berkeley. Isn't that right, Nancy? No? Where? He works at GTE, Sylvania. Okay. He writes papers. He, he's, a, he's, a, he's a paper writer in the Bay Area. <laughs> yes, Nelson Blackman. And, um, and uh, he, he caught me on... Uh, the very, you know, handout number two here where I said the above proof actually commits another sin against uh, mathematical exposition and he says it's better to say the proof above actually commits another sin against mathematical exposition. Yeah, uh, peccavi. Uh, I, I was certainly uh, uh, sinning here myself. Um, <clears throat> and, um, I, and I find that I, I do this rather often, and the reason must be because I, I, I don't find it unusual construction. Uh, on the other hand, I, so I don't quite agree with all of his comments that put in the margin. He said, above, below, afraid, alone, beneath, ahead, underneath, are among the adjectives that never precede the nouns they modify, yeah, but, but, but go after. Well, now, I don't view those all as adjectives. Uh, but I was using one as it as an, uh, the above proof, so I was using it as an adjective there, although it's, it's a preposition. And if you say the proof above, then you're sort of using it as a preposition with a, that, that, whose object is implied, I guess. I'm not, I'm not a scholar on these things, um, but um, below, I don't know um, if I would call it an adjective if I said the proof below or something, whatever. Um, uh, above and below are, however, different. We we say all of the above, none of the above. It's a it's a common phrase that we uh, we now all understand, and it just happens that above has this as one of its meanings. And because it, because above and below are are parallel in some places, doesn't mean that they that all of their meanings are going to be parallel to each other. Um, still, this would definitely be an uh, an improvement to put the put the above second, the word above second there. Uh, he circled I E here, and I suppose he just meant that that was a stylistic lapse to go into into Latin and formalism. I don't know. He wanted me to wanted me to use a semicolon there um, because he felt that you needed more of a uh, more time to read the um, to read the rest of the sentence or something. The proof was going too fast for your comprehension. Otherwise, it's a matter of pacing. That's a that. Uh, uh, you can best judge when you're second reading. Them. But the main the main thing I get from this is that um, it, I'm reminded that um, uh, the style has to be your own, and you won't get. And there are going to be a lot of places where you're just going to have to agree to disagree. That uh, there is no what some people would never write, other people would 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 always write and would think was better. And uh, this is this, especially at this time of year. I remember this, uh, reminded of this, because my wife and I compose a newsletter every year, uh, uh, telling uh, the story of that year for our friends and, and relatives and so on. Um, and 
many years ago we, we realized that the only way to solve this problem was that, that she would write a paragraph and then I would write a paragraph. There was no way that we could both write a sentence that we would both think was the right, was a good sentence. And um, we, you know, we, um, we seemed to you know, get along 364 days of the year except for the day that we tried to write a joint Christmas newsletter. There was just no way to, to make the two styles uh, merge. Um, but with the separate paragraphs, that works rather well, and, and even we, we even can, can say, did you, wouldn't it be better to put a comma in, in the other person's paragraph? And, and sometimes we accept that as a, as a valid uh, improvement. Um, uh, still, there's, there's definitely uh, uh, a lot of variety uh, uh, and uh, viva la difference. Um, now, Nancy, your father didn't like the way I spelled I, I want to make a comment. You know, Jimmy and Ralph and Carter wrote a book together. Here it's on. And, uh, oh, there you are, Lynn. Yeah, and, and that was the comment that they, that they made, that they can do everything else together in their life except they can't seem to write together, and it was the worst experience either of them had ever been through. Oh, okay, yeah. So, the, I, I, and I guess it would be the same... Uh, uh, with a co-author, if you had to, if you had to agree on every sentence of every of, of every uh, uh, paragraph, right? Now, um, Nancy probably didn't like the way we spelled hiccups here, and I and I uh, and said that this is the, the proper way to spell it. So I looked it up in the dictionary. I looked it up first in in the this, in, in Roger's, and Roger didn't even have this spelling. It had this spelling, and then in the other dictionary I had in my desk. Uh, this was the preferred spelling, and they said C also, or, or also sometimes spelled this way. But uh, okay, that that uh, um, was uh, that caught me by surprise. Um, uh, okay, now here is one for um, uh, for Paul to look at. He cautioned us: Is this right? Is this uh, is this a bad uh, thing to use to, to use a noun as a verb? I don't know. Um, but um, there wasn't the comment here from from, um, from Nancy's father. But now here's something I I don't understand. He he said it says depending on the formula, the terms relation, definition, statement, or theorem might be used. Um, he wanted it to be term. Seems to me. Yeah, I know. But still, it um, I'm 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 ready for for a list of terms. Um, uh, but I suppose, uh, literally speaking, if you wanted to look at this from a logical point of view, then he, uh, we're saying that um, um, you're supposed to do, I don't know, there's the word or in there. It doesn't seem to me that I have to use more than one. Um, wanted to hyphenate programming language. Um, when we talk about programming language notation, now, for, for me, um, I would be hyphenating words all over the place if I did that because I, because I'm when I'm familiar with it since it's in the field where programming language uh, uh, is uh, you know it's commonly uh, understood as as um, as a sort of a sub discipline by itself and wouldn't need it but so the hyphen is sort of implied to me I don't know um, may I make a comment yes Paul At what do you the think? associative law should worry you is it a programming language notation or a programming language notation? Yeah. There's no, there's absolutely no uh, uh, confusion to a computer scientist, you see. But to someone who, who isn't, I can see where this would, would this happen. So, so, so I spoke once about uh, random number generators and uh, and uh, and floating point arithmetic and and uh, and I, I had a book about these things and I and I had to take out all the hyphens afterwards because it was just looking terrible and you referring them all the time. Um, okay, well, the let's see the next thing I wanted to show is uh, about hopefully uh, I guess no no well. Well, I, while I see it here, I got another, an, another. I, I, I got an interesting note from Leslie Lamport who, about proof by contradiction. So we should talk a little bit about that. Um, and uh, he started out uh, um, obviously. In, in, he, 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 he wants, he wants to, um, uh, to, uh, uh, to rile us right away. He says, uh, "I had to leave the tube just as Helmus was beginning to diatribe against proof by Daniel." <laughs> I'm not, even I have never seen diatribe before used as a verb, but that's great. Um, um, uh, in order to, you know, in order to set a, a moot, nah, well, but, but he's saying, 
Um, uh, what about co proof by contradiction? Are they always bad? And I, I don't think we ever said that they're always bad. Um, what we said was that if that there's such a thing as an unnecessary proof by contradiction, which and if you can do it directly, um, uh, do so. But he's pointing out a case where where he where uh, uh, in in his work on um, on studying concurrent programs that um, really contradiction turned out to be the the natural intuitive way to actually uh, to actually do it. And, and uh, so let me, let me uh, state, in fact, that when you're solving a problem, probably the, the most efficient way to go about it is to, is to try first the proof by contradiction. Proof by, I mean, this is, this is sort of a, so, so if I'm writing a book and, 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 the, and the writing of the book is supposed to illustrate all the, all the things that I tossed around in my mind as I was working on the problem myself, um, uh, then the, the most honest presentation would probably be to say, well, I first tried proving by contradiction. Now, why is that? It's because it gives me more hypotheses. I, I, I got more power, more things to derive from. I, I, have a, I, I can assume the contradiction that gives me more assumptions, and therefore, I, 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 you know, more of my theorems come to play. Um, and then, at, and so actually, when I'm working on a new problem, probably uh, contradiction. You know, I mean, I mean, it's not just that I'm a contrary person. I think that I that, uh, that that I need to get my juices stirred up in order to in order to say no, it's wrong. And, um, uh, but, but in fact, it, it, it gives you more. It gives you more to work with. On the, uh, on the other hand, it, it does. It, it, it actually uh, can can limit the uh, the applicability of your theorem afterwards. If you if you really need to rely on the contradiction, and it also can be very confusing to a, uh, to a reader. So so there's this this. Uh, um, but but there's this tension that all that happens. I think in all problem solving, uh, you the, the the method that you first. Try to solve something. It doesn't necessarily lead to the thing that you want to present in your final exposition of the of the solution. Um, uh, so um, uh, so there there will certainly be cases where where a proof by contradict. I, I guess Paul mentioned this too that uh, you know he doesn't he, he's not going to uh, uh, exclude the middle. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the, he's not going to disallow, uh, he's not going to go like intuitionist mathematics and say that uh, you're not ever allowed to, uh, to, sh to show that something is true because it can't be false. Um, uh, uh, and I, I, would, I would hate to uh, have that weapon, weapon um, removed, uh, too. Okay, now let's see. Another thing I wanted to show you that's short. Uh, is in a paper that I was asked to referee recently, and I just want to show a very common error when mathematicians use tech. They believe that um, that the best way to write fractions is the way they write them on a blackboard. And uh, I think you can see here that this fraction would be much nicer if it had been done in the slashed form, n squared slash three instead of instead of in these tiny numbers here, like this. And you see how it how it. Uh, how it interferes with uh, with the looks. Now, 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 um, the people at, at behind the scenes at journals have been doing this for years. Mathematicians give them manuscripts that have these fractions done like this, and then the copiers know how to how, how to how to make these changes um, and make make the thing come out. But now that people now the mathematicians are getting this uh, in their own hands, and they're, they're going to bypass the copy editors, and they're they're going to and they're going to ruin everything if they. Uh, if they uh, don't learn about uh, some fractions, uh, about about when when some fractions look better than others. Okay. Comments on that. Okay. Next was um, uh, things about hopefully. Now, uh, we had this wonderful essay near the beginning of the quarter. Uh, uh, I guess it's handout number four that uh, talks about hopefully and Mary Claire. Uh, I, I passed it out more for the for the style of writing of the essay than for the actual semantics of it, which I, w also makes points about about the word hopefully. But I just I, I just put it out as a as, as a sort of a marvelous essay uh, in general, um, and it was an exposition of a technical point. Um, as so, as an example of exposition, is and I is the reason I handed this out now. Um, uh, so Mary Claire then sends me a note says um, actually I now that you now that you decided to to put this to a wider audience I reread it again and I thought it was terrible and so she said so she definitely has to change two things about this essay to improve it 
and I want, and I think this is interesting to see the before and after because because I I, well, I started with this and I thought it was 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 very nice, but then she she looked at it and she thought, uh, oh, this got to be fixed up, and um, and so the first so the, so the first thing she, she she points out is she says, look at, um, given that I'm going to need to say. 1637. I have to say something else instead of late in the 16th century. So here's her. So here she definitely knows that uh, you know, looking ahead at what she's going to have to say, she's going to. She wants to give a citation where the only appropriate way to to to, to give it is to give an actual actual year, 1637. But then right in the beginning of her, her very opening sentence, talk talk about late in the 16th century, and the, and there's there's different. Uh, so that's a different um, way of giving dates. And if you give if this is a big book, you're allowed to use different ways to give dates. But if you're writing a four-paragraph essay on something, um, it's better to, to to do something. And especially 16. The, the two numbers 16 are are a little. Um, uh, I mean, people reading 16th century, uh, uh, you know, if they think about it, they, they'll know it's it's really the 1500s. But um, uh, it, it's uh, but still the 16 uh, sticks in the in the head more than the than, than the semantics of the 15. So she would then change this to late in the 15 late in the 1500s in order to be consistent with her 1930s and 16th and on getting the other ones in there. I, I figure. Then she says, here's a sentence. She said, impersonal. Substantives, on the other hand, serve less often than personal ones at the head of the kind of active verbs we modify with adverbs of manner. She says, "This sentence is so horrid. I prefer to think I was drunk when I wrote it. Um, uh, to fix it, I have to rewrite the whole paragraph, sliding adverb of manner up earlier." So she's talking about something called an adverb of manner, and her her point here is that there are different kinds of adverbs, and and so she she rewrites the sentence as follows. This will be in the notes. Uh, as with most adjectives, both of these hopefuls regularly produced hyphen Lee adverbs of manner. The kind of hopefulness that make, means expectant and eager produced adverbs more readily than the kind that means promising and bright. There's nothing mysterious about the difference in frequency. The pattern such and such which he displays here is very common. A person can carry himself hopefully or eye a desirable object hopefully or prepare himself hopefully for a possible future. Um, uses himself here. The pattern, impersonal noun, active verb, adverb of manner, is less common. Impersonal nouns serve less often than personal ones. Nonetheless, a waiter can be shaping up, hopefully a day can begin, hopefully, and so on. Now, this is the, um, uh, so this is a rewrite of the sentence that I think is worthwhile looking at. And, and so, somehow that, that, that paragraph, uh, I guess the sentence wasn't wasn't great, but I. But since it was embedded there in the middle, uh, it didn't. Uh, you know, I didn't. Uh, uh, it, it got by me. Okay, I was willing to to accept anything by the time I had such nice uh, such a nice intro into into the thing. Uh, I got another comment on hopefully from the teacher in uh, in the English department at Stanford. Um, um, fairly, I don't know. Aha! Uh -huh. Well, you see. Uh, you, when you write something, you never know <laughs> who you will be reaching. So, so uh, now I don't know if this uh, person is male or female, but uh, but uh, so if I can't refer to him or her by an by a pronoun, but I will say <laughs> this. Uh, I will say that um, that Robin is teaching a class next quarter, English 191A called called writing about science. And uh, that's why I, I, I uh, uh, thought I would get in communication and uh, said that, uh, uh, and she commented about handout number four. Uh, she thought that the current prissiness over hopefully was useful because she was taught as a graduate student, he was taught, whoever Robin was taught, always to say something positive about every student paper. It's not always easy in business. Uh, I shouldn't be putting this on TV, I'm sure. <laughs> Neatly typed is really too patronizing and often inaccurate, but I can almost always say thank you for not abusing the word hopefully, since students avoid it like the play. Well, <clears throat> now, a question? Yes? Uh, on that preceding paper, I noticed that, you know, with the parentheses, um, formula, formulae as the plural. Oh, formula. yes, right here, yeah. Okay, uh, formula that versus formula. Or is that still used? Oh, well, well, you see, I, I, if you'll probably notice, uh, 
Paul uses formulae in his notes, and Tracy uses formulas in it. But you know, and so you, I, I thought it must be British spelling. Um, and and I'll, I, I, I'll take any chance to use my AE ligature um, uh, now that I have it. Um, in fact, I even write letters to people in, in Phoenix, Arizona, just so I can use the OE. Uh, um, um, <clears throat> now, um, Bob Floyd sent me comments on hopefully, which is really uh, gets to a point that I hope I remember to make. Um, so first of all, he says, um, hopefully, um, he shows the American Heritage Dictionary, okay, uh, which is, um, which has a usage note. Uh, there's two versions of the American Heritage Dictionary. This one says, the use of hopefully to me is to be hoped, as in hopefully we'll get there before dark, is grammatically justified by analogy and similar uses of happily and mercifully. However, this usage is by now such a bugbear to traditionalists that it is best avoided on grounds of civility, if not logic. <laughs> okay. And so Bob's comment on this is, American heritage justifies it by analogy to happily and mercifully. I disagree. Mercifully will get there before dark equals, it is merciful that we will get there before dark, not I am merciful that we'll get there before dark. Hopefully we'll get there before dark means I am hopeful that we'll get there before dark. He, so he doesn't see the, one of the points of Mary Carr's essay, which he hadn't read at the time he sent me this note, was the that hopeful is is used in both senses, personal and impersonal. But uh, but um, uh, I think the point is is um, uh, uh, that there are a lot of people whose hackles get up, just as it says here. Um, it's a bugbear to a lot of people, which means that it's very so that it's very uh, uh, problematical to if, uh, to to decide whether you're going to use it in the writing. As Mary Claire said in her essay. What should we do? Ignore the ignorant bully boys or knuckle under? Um, and as for she's made a made a, uh, a point here. Well, then Bob sent me another note saying that there's an unabridged American Heritage Dictionary that has that that um, noted that 44 per, only 44 percent of the usage panel will accept hopefully in the sense of it is to be hoped. So they have this percentage, you know, uh, uh, William, whatever his name was, wrote to wrote to all of his usage people and gave them a long questionnaire about two two thousand two thousand words or questions, and they all uh, uh, voted on it. And then he reports the statistics in this, in a, and uh, they're usually pretty interesting. Um, so I think that's pretty good. Forty-four percent actually accept it. That's pretty. That's pretty. That's pretty good. But um, uh, in fact, fifty-six percent uh, do not. Um, so it is. Um, um, a word that has that has problems just on the basis of uh, uh, you know that you're going to offend a certain number of people even if you use it probably absolutely correctly and so it's a matter of uh, uh, the similar to the rules with uh, with quotation marks if you want to if if, if you want to uh, uh, help make the revolution towards the towards the improvement and consider that more of a risk than than irritating some some of the readers uh, or distracting them away from the the, the, the points you're trying to make for them, then um, uh, you should you should by all means uh, uh, push on. Uh, yeah. Ah, oh, this is what I was just going to get to, um, and and I was and that was another thing that Bob sent to me. Saying that uh, yes, our, our friend here from Austria uh, uh, knows that that, that Hoffentlich is a very good uh, German word, and and in fact it has exactly the right meaning that everybody who who misuses hopefully in America wishes that they had a word for, and this is the the function is needed, and and, and yeah. Yeah, the German word Hoffentlich is it's it's used much more often than than the hopefully in the other meaning. So yes. Really yes, it's a yeah, it, the other word is Hoffman's fall. Hoff Hoffman's fall? Hoffman's fall, okay. So it's it's um and so so there's there yeah, so a, a couple of the um, things that that I got here uh talked about talk about uh Hoffenlich and uh and uh uh and it certainly fills the need. In fact there are many there are many other as you, the more you write, the more you realize there are there are words that just don't exist in English that we that we really have a need for. And, and uh, in technical writing, the ones that I miss most often are verbs that 
that imply that you're losing something instead of winning something. I mean, I, we, we have all kinds, we have, we have uh, sports writers will have a hundred ways to describe the fact that, that, that team A beat team B. They, they bested them, they murdered them, et cetera, et cetera, they clobbered them. Uh, now, how many is it for the opposite? What, what can you say that, that, that B did to A when, when B lost the game? Uh, there isn't such a thing. You have to say it in two or three words. And, uh, but in mathematical writing, we like to have um, the ability to uh, to have these words, and we don't we don't always ha we we often are missing are missing them. Um, now let's see. Um, uh, well, I don't. Uh, this is uh, I can't find what is this Bernstein or somebody who had talked about hopefully and and hopefully, but some of the comments that the, that that uh, that Bob sent me were. Obviously, from the people that Mary Claire was reading, where she got upset about the uh, the people who really didn't know what they were talking about, um, because some of the some of the comments that that have been have been been said about it are are pretty um, are, are pretty off the off the mark. Still, uh, it's a matter of uh, how risk how much you want to risk of offending the. Uh, um, uh, the, the sensibilities of certain of certain readers, as opposed to uh, uh, you know, you, you can maybe get their goodwill by by other things that you say, and uh, and so it can be uh, important. Okay, now the next thing, Bob, I quoted Bob Floyd about exclamation points, and he said, uh, he, um, he, I fear you misunderstood my attitude on exclamation points. They're correct after interjections, like ouch. After sentences, there are exclamations like "Don't you dare!" when exclaimed or shouted, and that's why they're called exclamation points. In informal writing, an author may be forgiven a few bangs on sentences one can imagine as exclamations, but a long sentence goes under the category "exclamations." We doubt ever got exclaimed. Okay. Now, um, so and then he he showed me uh, he showed me uh, 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 excerpts from dictionaries where they give a definition of exclamation point, and it always says something that follows an exclamation. Now that surprised me because uh, I mean that surprised me exclamation point because uh, no, nobody in, in the references that I saw seemed to ever suggest that exclamation point is ever used to convey surprise. Isn't that true though? That sometimes you can that I mean is this only in children's stories that you, that that this happened? Um, uh, that you say the bed was empty or something, uh, but you know that's not nobody was exclaiming it, but it was or something. Uh, Paul, what do you think? There is a writing device that works very well in that very context. To put an exclamation, put parenthesis, exclamation point, close parenthesis after a sentence for which you want to express surprise or an eyebrow mm -hmm. raised. Oh, okay. I and it doesn't right. violate the rule that you oh. are quoting, and at the same time makes the very point you want to make. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good thought, right? Okay. Let's see. Bob. Uh, Bob says um, uh, uh, advice to always avoid splitting infinitives is unwise, and um, and uh, and he sends me several references about that, and uh, and that's true. That uh, almost everybody says uh, it. Uh, Split infinitive is sometimes just the right thing to do, uh, but because it, it puts the ac when, it, when it puts the accent in the right way. But they, but the the bad examples tend to be where where uh, the um, where an unsplitting the infinitive gives an obvious uh, obviously improved sentence. The, the good examples are the ones where where moving the ad the adverb um, around um, make the sentence seem very forced. So it's a matter of ear there. Uh, he says about prepositions at the end of sentences, um, uh, and then he gives some some references there. He says, "You have no case. Give up." Um, and he ends it with "up," of course. But uh, I, I I looked at the uh, I looked at the things, and I I, I totally agree. Uh, I have no case. I, I mean, I coming from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where uh, ha half the population is um, is is German and is used to putting the uh, uh, the first part of a, a, a uh, the, the uh, preposition part of a verb at the end of their sentences, uh, uh, I probably overreacted to this. And there, but but uh, English teachers do do say this. Um, uh, Miss, what is her name? Um, Miss Thorn with Thorn with the, what's her? The, the prototypical English teacher that's that people talk about. 
um, says uh, she would she would give you know Mark, Miss, Miss Thistlebottom there she is up with which I will not put um, and uh, so uh, uh, talks about the uh, the main idea is that the preposition provides strength at the end of the sentence and 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 a bad example is he felt it offered the best opportunity to do fundamental research in chemistry which was what he had taken his doctor of philosophy degree in and he says the end of the sentence is a conspicuous point can be a strong point the end of the sentence just quoted is like the last sputter of an engine going dead that's the uh, um, so th that's the uh, thing about preposition okay um, okay let's see he, sh he shows me strunk and white about the word about using that um, Strunk said something about, uh, where are we here, exclamation point, Strunk and why. Well, they, they, he gave an example, said, uh, something like, uh, he said he was going in, as, as being better than he said that he was going. And I agree, uh, but, but, it's, but you have the chance that, the, but you can parse it immediately because you know the word he is there. In the in the uh, in the sentence because it's a, it's, a, it's a pronoun and so it has a different form um, as it would in another part of a sentence so you don't so so the word that is is, is not needed as a grammatical help to tell you what's coming up but it, but in when we're doing technical writing we're not usually talking about um, uh, uh, pronouns like this but we usually are in a situation where there's some noun where we would we, we wouldn't know what the we wouldn't know exactly what uh, what parts of speech we're looking at as we're coming into it so. Uh, I have found that often I put in the word that just in order to be a sort of silent helper uh, um, uh, to to uh, to parse it. Now the final thing I wanted to discuss is a very interesting note I got from Dan Schroeder here about which versus that. Now I know you've heard all, you thought you've heard everything about which versus that already, but um, uh, I I uh, would like to. Uh, uh, say the final truth about that subject. If I can only find my uh, Dan's comment here, I got to I got to get it on my where are we here? Can I ask you a question while you're looking at yeah. you can answer it. Okay. Um, what about if then? Didn't you say at some point early in the quarter that you would always have a then if you had an if clause? If oh. uh, then or what, not? What do you think? I don't know. The woman from the Chronicle got up and said, what are all these then doing here? It looks like yeah. it's translated from a programming language. Well, she's, I, I just saw the notes and, and it said that she had uh, a sentence with many thens in it, one sentence with four or five thens in it, which, uh, which uh, could, could perhaps be broken, broken into. However, uh, uh, I, I think there's a difference between um, uh, newspaper writing and uh, writing about mathematics in 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 some cases where you where we're talking about implications of of uh, comments okay ah here we go good so um, I uh, again it's something that my wife and I may not agree on but but when I when, when I read something at speed and I find that I don't understand that I'm now getting to the conclusion but if I put the word then in, I would understand that. Then, I, then, then it helps, and it and uh, it, it ties in with the point I want to make uh, now is that I I believe when we when we are reading something um, at speed for for comprehension, our main um, our, uh, we are using a, a part of our brain that's only doing simple parsing and not doing complicated logical reasoning as to how as to as to what should be done now uh, I mean it's simple enough that it can be done in a few cycles of, of, of our very slow uh, 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 computer inside of our heads um, and uh, therefore um, uh, well let, let me show you the the point at issue now now I, I, I changed which to that in five places of Dan's term paper when he turned it in and he uh, uh, thought that um, uh, he would uh, uh, 
he says, I must emphasize, in all five of these sentences I used which only after carefully considering whether that would be preferable. I have now considered each of them even more carefully and concluded that blindly changing which to that would be appropriate in at most one of the sentences. So he's willing to give me a, a, a less than or equal 20% on this here. Um, now, <clears throat> let me explain my reasoning. And my, the, one of the main points I want to try to make is that maybe reasoning is not the thing involved here. That it's, that something, it's something that goes by too fast in your head to, to even care about reasoning. It's a matter of, of uh, more, syntax more than semantics. And, and the, the, the sentence at issue is the second one here. Our discussion will contain many gaps which this approach from the bottom up cannot fill. And, he, and his comment is uh, about sentence two, saying that um, here I see no way to use that without implying that there are also gaps that this approach can't fill, that this approach can fill, and there aren't. In other words, um, he's saying that you, that if that it, it, since the since the word that is supposed to be used in a restrictive manner, you're not supposed to talk about the a that b unless there also exists some A that, for which not B is true. Um, and uh, my, my, I, I, don't, I don't agree. I think that, that, uh, I think that the, here we have a case where, where we have a grammatical construction where it's one way of, a, of attaching an attribute to, to A is saying, is saying B is also true about A. Uh, now, it, now it's a strong way of doing it because it's, it, 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 it goes in a, in a hurry and we're talking about the A that B. But, now, but the, it, I don't believe that whenever you read a sentence that has the word that in it, you also stop and say, now he's implying that this, this, is, restric that this is restrictive, that, that, that um, I, I'm now getting an assertion from the author that, 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 that a gap uh, um, could, could fill some, some other approach or something like this. So I asked Mary Claire specifically about this, and she agreed that <clears throat> the word that would be uh, uh, preferable here. I mean, it's not, there's, not, there's certainly no objection to it. And my, 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 the point is, if you have to go back and, and rethink and use logic on a sentence, then, then uh, it's not the kind of the, 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 way, the way it seems to me where, where my, my, my brain is going along reading it, just parsing it for. for for, for meaning, um, I, I, uh, this witch catches me as a as something where the where there was a missing comma if it's going to be a witch, uh, without thinking about it. But if I, if I have a gap here, I mean if I have a that here, uh, I would just attach the uh, this as a clause on, and I wouldn't really worry a great deal as to how restrictive it's being in the world. Wit. Well, at. <laughs> point about an A that B would better be an A that not B sounds to me like a step in the direction of the disastrous possibility of making the, the syntactical correctness undecidable. That is, it depends <laughs> on the content of the paragraph. Okay. And uh, yeah. lots it, of people do make recommendations that amount to that when you analyze them. Yeah, so, so um, uh, I, I think that if, if you have to go to a long dissertation about, about the logic of it, then, then it's missing the point of uh, the way we actually read. Uh, that's my my uh, uh, long dissertation on that subject. Now, a question, uh, so question. Wouldn't it be okay just to put the comma in and make that a non-restrictive clause? Because we are saying, I mean, didn't we say that like all the gaps? Oh yeah. Well, we've got various uh, approaches here now. Um, but they, but anyway, uh, uh, Dan's Dan's rewrite is much better. He's, he just decides to 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 tear up the whole thing and start over. Of course, this intuitive bottom-up approach will contain many gaps. Uh, in other words, when, when you run into a problem, usually the best way is to just is to just uh, uh, finesse it. And go, you know. So, uh, and uh, Mary Claire would would prefer saying bottom up with a hyphen instead of in quotes here. Um, um, and uh, it's a, it's a matter of taste to try and see there whether you want to apologize for using bottom up um, in a physics book uh, can I, or can not. Can I summarize something there? I mean, I think in every one of those five sentences. There was a problem with the sentence, and on, on yeah. one hand, I did think that changing which to that was not the solution. Nevertheless, the fact that there was a possibly wicked witch pointed to other problems. And yeah. like you say, if you have to think that long about a sentence, there's something wrong with it in the first place. I, yeah, but, but, I, but there's an automatic parsing provided by that, which is mostly a, a, a coupling of a noun to a property that I, that I don't think uh, 
Now, if, if you just want to couple it now to a property quickly, you can do it that, better with that than, than with widgets. Now, now, there was a very amusing case of left to right reading in, the, in, in Mary Claire's um, a comment on, on, another, on another point and says, uh, even if coincident punctuation were a problem, the author is mistaken about where the which clause ends. Do you get this? Uh, I was expecting the next word to be judgment or opinion or something. The author's mistake, you know. So, the, um, uh, but she's talking now that that was, that was an interesting, uh, so, so you have to look for the sentences to be able to understand as you, where you are, what, or not be surprised by the word about when it occurs at the beginning, especially if it occurs at the end of a line, of course. Um, and, and, uh, uh, I see I'm a little bit over time. Thank you, Tracy. Um, but I have to show you this. There's something about coincident uh, uh, punctuation here which hadn't been brought up earlier in the course. So he said, um, um, coincident commas are not a sign of bad punctuation any more than the coincidence of a final comma in a period or a final comma in a semicolon or any two marks of punctuation. Where two commas coincide, we write only one. She's talking about where where, where you would have a sentence where uh, each there's two reasons to have a comma in one place. And she says there's no point. So when a comma and a period coincide, we write the period. Etc. This is where a period and a period coincide. Obviously, you see. I thought that was nice, um, um, nice example there. Okay, I have gotten to the end of my list, and I want to thank you all for uh, enduring this uh, this quarter. And I look forward to reading your term papers uh, before uh, 5 p.m. next week, uh, Wednesday, sharp Pacific Standard Time. No, not well. Having them in my possession. Thank you.